you brought, brought your Bibles, please open to Luke chapter 23. Did y'all get excited about Easter? I love Easter because at Christmas there's great spiritual significance, but it can get drowned out in all the chapters of Christmas. But in Easter, you're free to focus on the truth. We're going to start reading. Luke chapter 23, verse 10. Luke 23, 10, this is the night when the Lord Jesus has been arrested. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies of each other. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before me, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges that you make against him. Let's skip to verse 18. But they cried out together, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. Verse 20, Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept calling out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt of any death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent, with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. Let's go down to verse 33. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garment among themselves. Now, what we need to know today as we read some more of the scripture, that that day, everybody had to choose up sides. Fence sitting was not an option the day that Jesus Christ was crucified. And before we go on and notice who chose which side, would you please notice that Jesus came down on our side in verse 23, or 33, he said, or 34, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Aren't you glad he always comes down on our side? Yes. <laughs> Look at verse 35. We're going to notice who. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him. Saying, he saved others, let him save himself if this is the Christ, his chosen one. So whose side did the rulers come down on? Most of them came down on the wrong side, right. and they sneered. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine. So the soldiers came down on the wrong side, they mocked. The rulers sneered, the soldiers mocked. Look at verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So one of the criminals hurled abuse. <coughs> the soldiers mocked. One of the criminals hurled abuse. But look at verse 40. The other answered and said, and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, we are suffering justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now the second criminal came down on the other side of the cross. He said, you are righteous and just, forgive me. Two equally guilty condemned criminals, one headed for paradise, the other for damnation. They were both going to die in a matter of hours all because of the position they took concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. And as improbable as it would seem, if you go back to verse 12, it says that two sworn enemies became friends that day because they came down on the wrong side of the cross. Verse 12 yeah. says Herod and Pilate yeah. became friends with one another that very day because up till then they'd been enemies. Well, what common ground did they find for friendship? The wrong side of the cross. How you relate to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ determines your eternal destiny, 
and it also, your depth of understanding of what happened that day determines the quality of life that you will enjoy on earth. Because when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, indifference is not an option. No. The centurion in charge of executions could have come down on either side, right? He could have stood there and mocked. Let's go to verse 40. I want you to think about this because we're going to do a series from today. This is the 3rd of March until east of the 31st of March. And it's going to be on the word of the cross. Because there's nothing in this life that affects you more than what you do with the word of the cross. And you say, well, Pastor, obviously we are here this morning on a good morning. It's a good morning to sleep nice and chilly and cozy, right? We're here because we believe in the cross, yes? But it is the depth of revelation that you have that will set you free, right. okay? Amen. So what did the centurion, which side did he come down on? Look at verse 46. Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. The way that Jesus died caused this man to praise. Here he was, a pagan Roman, who became a believer in the true and living God and began praising the true and living God because he saw how Jesus died. He came down on the right side yeah. of the cross. If you go down to verse 50 to 53, you'll see another completely different man. Verse 50, and a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and a righteous man. He had not consented to their plan of action. A man from the city of Arimathea who was waiting for the kingdom of God, this man went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus and he took it down and wrapped it in a linen cloth, laid him in a tomb and cut into the rock where no one had ever yet lain. Here was a good and righteous man who had been secretly a disciple and that day he had to choose. Yeah. Do I Siding with my friends who are mocking and sneering, or do I come and take the body of this one I love so much and honor him in death? He chose the truth about the cross at the expense of rejection Amen. of his peers. Yeah. So, to review, Herod and Pilate struck up a friendship on the wrong side of the cross. The religious leaders steered, the soldiers mocked, the criminals hurled abuse. While on the other side of the cross, a previously pagan Roman centurion praised the true and living God, a condemned prison criminal encounters sudden unexpected redemption <coughs> of his creator. Amen. Highly respected member of the Jewish Sanhedrin came out that day, unashamedly declaring through his actions, I too believe in him. Everybody has to choose when faced with the cross. You will see that the magnitude of the event requires all of us to take a position and you think, well, but I've already taken a position. Well, what I'm going to try to talk to you about this month is that the cross is the central event of all human history. And actually, the, the cross is the central event of all human thinking. Because when you really understand what Jesus did through, for us through his death, burial, and resurrection, there should never be a thought that we think that is not colored by the cross, illuminated by the cross. It changes everything about our lives. Hallelujah. Paul wrote many years later, if you've got your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be most of the rest of the time in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. You see, it's really easy in American society. We're uh, always encouraged to go with what's popular, what's oh, yeah. palatable, what's mm -hmm. not offensive, politically correct, right? Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that the power that we seek from God is in the word of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Paul writes, For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. When Jews see a picture of Jesus on the cross, that's a tremendous stumbling block to them. Yeah. They're offended by it even today. <coughs> when unbelievers, you try to talk to them about the cross, it's foolishness to them. Yeah. It makes no sense to them. But when believers look at the cross, they say, look, the power of God and the divine wisdom of God. In what way was it the divine wisdom of God? Nothing else in the world could have reversed our fate except God himself. Wow. And yeah. the power of God, when he put the power in the resurrection, 
There was so much power in the resurrection. He was not only overcoming rigor mortis in Jesus' body. The resurrection was not just to raise a physical body that had gone into decay. The resurrection was to reverse the fate of all mankind. It was to reverse everything that Adam had done for the sin. Do you know how massive that is? Praise God. Today, today's sermon is mainly theology. Theology. And I might not be greatly entertaining, but what you understand about what happened in the resurrection will revolutionize your thinking. Amen. You see, I can't remember a time that I did not know the words to the old rugged cross. And I still love that song. It's dated in its tune, but you know, I remember from the old rugged cross. Amen? But as a child, I did not understand the meaning, except for the fact that I didn't have to go to hell, which is very, very, very good news. There's so much more to it. We want to talk about that today. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ has always been and is still today the great dividing line of the ages. When you preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, sides are instantly drawn. At the mention of his name, every single person will use it either as a cuss word or as in great reverence. It's either the most precious name in your life or you're using it in blasphemy. Isn't that interesting? There is no middle ground. One of the reasons I want to preach this message is that you have to understand that in your witnessing, you never ever take anything personally. Because when you feel antipathy toward the gospel, it is not antipathy toward you. It is toward the message that someone has rejected. The only thing that is astonishing about the controversial nature of the cross is that we are still astonished by it. That's true. Isn't that right? You know, tonight they're putting out that new series on the Bible, and I hope it, I hope it's every bit as good as they're saying it is. We hope it is. I hope I hate to promote it from the pulpit if I haven't seen it because I've heard it before and then it hasn't. I believe this is going to be good. And I heard someone that I thought was a believer interviewing this couple, Roma McDowney or something. I don't, I've never watched Touched by the Angels. I've just I never watched a lot of TV. But these are good Christian people. She grew up in a Christian home in Ireland, her husband in a Christian home in Great Britain. And someone that I thought was a believer was challenging them on this. And they said, how can you treat these allegorical stories that we know to be allegorical as reality? He says, you're acting like they really happened. And they said, well, sir, we grew up believing they did really happen, and we do believe they really happened. Amen. Now, here is this great dividing line. Even if someone who nominally is a Christian, this enormous dividing line of whether it's all reality or whether it's a real good thought. Come on. The, I want to read this one statement again. The only thing astonishing about the controversial nature of the cross is that we are still astonished about it. We should yeah. never be astonished about it. It's the dividing line of history. It is. Now, of course, the persecution, you're always going to get persecution when you talk to somebody about Jesus for right. one reason. You are holding up in Satan his yeah. ultimate, total, complete defeat, and he knows it. And you are also holding up the one hope of that person's freedom. Wow. So when we, when we preach the cross, when we share the cross with someone, we must never be ashamed and we must never be astonished. Right. Because there's always going to be a war within them right. until they bow right. the cross. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is impressive in the unique nature of the sacrifice. If you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 13. Paul asks a question here. He says, has Christ been divided? They were taking up denominations, like in the verse before, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And what's he saying? There's only, this is a rhetorical question. Of course, Paul was not crucified. It would have done you no good in the world for the great apostle Paul to be crucified for you. Right. There was only one sacrifice in all time and eternity that qualified as a substitute of our sins because of the magnitude of our sins. The substitute had to be utterly holy and utterly perfect. So we see in the cross of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, the uniqueness of the sacrifice. The second thing we see about the cross is it is impressive in its universal nature. Look at what Revelation 1, 7 says. <clears throat> Jesus is talking here. He said, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. How is he identified, even in the book of Revelation, as the one whom he pierced? And you say, well, what's the point of that? Because it says, well, watch this, it says, Even those who pierced him, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. 
He was crucified for every single person. Yeah. And that's why it's so confrontational in its nature. It says all the tribes were born because he died for every human being. Making a decision about the Lord Jesus when you witness to someone is absolutely unavoidable because he died. He put himself out there for every man. Amen. The other thing that astonishes me is <coughs> by the magnitude of the cross and the magnitude of what he did for us, a four-year-old child can grasp this. Amen. 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 You, you talk to a child and they get it. They're aware of their need even as a little one. The cross is unique because he's the only one who could have done what he did. It's universal because it applies to every man. And it is astonishing in its magnitude because of the depth of the rebellion it had to undo. You see, this is one thing about the cross. We all know we've sinned. But you see, it wasn't just anybody who sinned. It was the very apex of creation. It was the one that he made in his image and breathed into himself, the very breath of life. We were honored above all creation in there in the Garden of Eden. We were to be the friends of Almighty God. It was incomprehensible to the angels what he had done. He yeah. said, let us make somebody just like us. And we spit in his face and said, we don't care if you thank you. We don't understand the depth of the rebellion. The magnitude of the sacrifice had to be cor correlate to the depth of the rebellion. Yeah. And, and it's just so astonishing. The cross is a stumbling block because. Now here we go. You see its uniqueness, its universal nature, the magnitude of what the cross did. But it's a stumbling block for one reason. And I think this will help you in your witnessing to acknowledge the cross. And its reality is to bow the knee because it is a very humbling thing to be died for. If someone saves your life, even in the natural, and they put their life at risk, and they save you, and you live because of them, for the rest of your life you will owe them a debt of gratitude. And you can never, even if you try to forget it, you can't forget that. Somebody died for you. Somebody put their life on the line. Yeah. If I hear and acknowledge the truth of Calvary, I instantly owe a debt of gratitude and service that I will never Amen. repay. My life will never be fully mine again if I acknowledge the cross. Is this bad wow. to you? Are y'all following this? I just want to look at the cross and what it means. And why sometimes when we witness, we're amazed in, at the solemnity and that this quick aversion, well, it's going to mean a, a change in absolutely everything that person knows. Because up until that time, their life is utterly their own to do anything selfishly they want to do. And from that point on, if they acknowledge the cross, their life will never be their sin again. Amen. If I see the truth of Calvary, then I understand that I am his twice over. First of all, by creation, because every breath I've ever drawn has come from him. Amen. And second, by redemption, because when I, after I had sinned, was belonging to Satan, he brought me back. I'm sure you've heard this story, but I used to tell it when I taught kids, and it's one of my favorite stories because there's nothing better. You know the story of about an eight-year-old little boy who got bored, and he put all his time into making this lovely little boat, and he made it absolutely darling, and it was well-balanced, and it sailed well, and it had a sail on it. And he would take it with him wherever he went, and one day he tied a string to it and let it just bob along in the creek while he was fishing, but the rainwaters came, and it was stronger than he thought, and the string broke. And he went tearing down the creek after it, and he spent hours trying to find it and never could it. And he went home sobbing and he said, well, my boat's gone. And she said, we can make another. And he said, no, it'll never be the same. A few days later, they were in town at the secondhand store. They were walking by, and he saw his boat in the window. And the guy wanted $5 for it. And he walked in, and he said, that's my boat. And he said, well, I don't know anything about it being in your boat. But somebody came in and sold it to me, and you can have it for $5. He said, but mister, it's mine. Bucks. And he went home and he started saving. You know, as a little kid, he took him a while. He got five bucks. So he went back in and he got his precious little boat and he walked out and he said to him, oh, You're never getting away from me again because now you're my twice over. I made you and I bought you. Wow. Now, if you want to know why you belong to God, wow. you just understand. He created you in your mother's womb. He gave you your first breath and the breath you're taking right now. He'll give you every breath until the day you go home. And apart from that, when, you sold, when we sold ourselves into Satan's hand, he bought you back. You're his twice over. Yeah. So whenever you share the good news of the cross, it's absolutely good news, but it's always confrontational. Because for someone to accept the message is to accept the fact that they are not their own. Amen. 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 
I want to talk to you about the fact that when we preach the gospel, we must always, you know, Paul of Mars Hill, he shared with him about the unknown God, and he never did preach the gospel, and he had a few converts, but he never saw the tremendous, tremendous, overwhelming revival he saw in other places, because the gospel is the, is the center, or the cross is the center of the gospel. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, but we're in chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Now the next two verses explain the gospel. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Number one, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Number two, he was buried. And number three, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. They say, oh, pastor, you know all that. Yes, but when your life centers around this revelation, you will understand today the name of the verse, or the name of the message is the word of the cross, the dividing line. This fact that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, that he was raised, divides you from your old man. You're going to see you crucified with him. It divides you from the past. The certificate of death that was written against you was nailed to the cross. It divides you from everything that would hurt or harm your destiny. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul's synopsis of the gospel is he died, he was buried, and he was raised the third day. I want to read you Hebrews 10, 14 from the message. The message translates this about Jesus' sacrifice. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. Wow. I'm going to read it again. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. And you know, when you receive the righteousness of God, you say, you know what, I believe that he did all that he did that I might walk holy and perfect righteous before him. Then you've got to let other people, you've got to treat other people like they're righteous too if they love Jesus. Right. Have I threw that in? we got to see each other through the lens of the gospel. Hallelujah. Now, all human history hinges on the cross. It pivots around the cross. From the time in the garden of... You see, there's no more central event in all of history, human or otherwise. You know why? Because we're the apple of God's eye. We're the center of his affections. The rebellion broke his heart. And the redemption gave him his heart back. All human history pivots around the cross. From the time of the Garden of Eden, if you read Genesis, Genesis 3, 15, the very day they rebelled, he promised a redeemer that would bruise Satan on the head. The day they rebelled, he said, I will put enmity between you. He's talking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You shall bruise him on the head, and he shall bruise you on the heel. Or you shall bruise him on the heel. So he promised a redeemer. And he said, well, you know, I've heard... This is what the enemy, I, I hardly ever preach on the cross. I dug through my notes. I, I remember one real good sermon that I liked. It was 2008. We have no hard it, but I found it. Now, why don't I preach more about the cross? Because everybody always thinks they know about the cross. Uh -oh. You want to tell me about the cross? I was raised with a preacher, so. Like I said, I could have explained the plan of salvation to you. A little kid. Nathan was less than three years old when he got saved. You say, how do you know? Because... He looked up at me and he grinned. He said, Mom, Jesus lives in our hearts. And he, he was like between two and a half and three years old. And I said, well, honey, he doesn't unless you ask him to come in. And he said, yeah, but I did. And I said, well, did he do it? He said, oh, my man, that is the smile of the redeemed. That is the smile of peace with God. That child knows God. So I understand that if you've been raised in the church, you say, Pastor, I know about the cross. But the truth of the matter is that the cross is your victory. It's your dividing line. Between, it is yeah. Understanding the, the magnitude of the cross will help you understand people's reactions yeah. to a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think, well, this is old news. No. I want to, I've got like 10 scriptures in Revelation where it talks about the wounds in his hands. Yeah. 
The fact, you will, a million trillion years from now, you will still acknowledge what he did for you because yeah. it's the biggest event of all history. Amen. Look at it, Revelation 13, 8 in the King James Version. This is an example. It says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. They're talking about the Antichrist there. Whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb. Which Lamb? The Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Even in Revelation, he's called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Why? Why do we keep thinking about this? Because it's the biggest event in time and eternity. Amen. The old crowd record cross is an eternal story, and it's the most breathtaking storyline ever conceived, the most daring covert operation ever carried out. Now listen, history, all human history hinges on the cross. Yep. We date our calendars from before and after when he came. Your history hinges on the cross, your personal history, from before you knew, and the after you came. It is the dividing line of the yeah. ages and the dividing line of all mankind. You can go to any country on earth, and you will find a fellowship of believers, a friendship in the kingdom, and then you'll find those that serve the enemy. Amen. It is the dividing line of the cross. Now, if you if you go back to 1 Corinthians 1, we'll spend just a few more minutes in 1 and 2. And you say, how can this message help me? Well, number one, it is the point of all of our lives to win people to Jesus. Amen. If it were not for this enormous need to reap the harvest, we could be in heaven with the one we love most. You say, you'd rather be in heaven? Hobbs said he would. Right. We prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, it says in Philippians. Well, we'd prefer that. We would. He said, why would you prefer that? There's no sequestration there. Yeah. By the way, I want you to know, I kept thinking this week, sequestration is a name. It's a name yeah. for a policy. But you know what Philippians 2 says? That God has granted the Lord Jesus a name that is above every name. Amen. If you are called by the name of yeah. Jesus, Amen. you have a name above sequestration, a name above pay cut, and you're going to take that and say, by the blood, by the power of the blood, I am immune to this. God can turn it for you good. He says he will. Romans 8, 28 says, if you love him, yeah. if you're following the call of God for his purpose, he'll cause it to work together for you good. You might have a little bit. I know Nathan's going to have some days off that he didn't expect to have off. And I'm not celebrating that, but I am celebrating Romans 8, 28, the truth of it, that God's able to turn sequestration for you good. And he said, how do we do that? I don't know. How do we redeem it so after the mess we made of things? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is to those who are is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yeah. You should never get mad at somebody that doesn't understand, because until the moment they take that, they're not going to understand. And then I'd like you to go to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, next chapter, the first two verses. Paul wrote, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now I'll tell you about preachers' temptations. I'm sure you think preachers have no temptations. Preachers have a desire to do well preaching. And I know there's oh. preachers sitting there right now. And, and they, you know, if they're honest with you, you do not want to sit down and then people say, well, you stumbled all over yourself, but you thought was good. No, you don't want to stumble all over yourself. You want to come with excellence of speech. You want to come off looking good. You want to really impress people with some wisdom, but look at what Paul said. He said, brother, when I came to you, I wasn't particularly superior in speech or wisdom. For I determined to know nothing in money but Jesus Christ. You say, well, why would someone want to do that? Because that's where the power is. Yeah, yes. The power is not in the fact that I can put words together pretty or hold your attention. Yeah. The power is in the fact that somebody loved you enough to put himself on the line. You know, Jesus had to do that by faith. Yeah. If that plan had not worked, he'd have been in hell forever. Come on. And you say, oh, come on, you get one. He, he died in faith. He, he, he was hung on the cross quoting Psalm 22. Go back and read Psalm 22. You'll find the very word. He said, into your hand I commit my spirit. I'm trusting you to raise me from the dead. Yeah. The Father did that. What kind of faith does that take? This was a plan that had never been worked before. The enemy certainly did not think it would work. He would never have tried it. He would never have crucified the Lord of glory. 
The gospel is the power of God. He said, when you know Jesus Christ and him crucified, there is not a problem that will not bow its knee. Paul says, I didn't come to a great oratorical spill. I think that's very encouraging for all preachers. Paul was not a great preacher. He said that. He said, I didn't come with And he said, well, but hope for this word for me. That the power is not in your tongue. The power is in the truth of what he did. He said, I didn't come to impress you with my great oratorical skills. I didn't try to wow you with my phraseology or deep wisdom. I just told you this. That God loved you so much that he let his own son be crucified for you. I wanted you to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you said, well, how in the world do you get a proud, proud that way? Let me tell you something. If we're not seeing people healed through this ministry, it's because we're not preaching the gospel. And you say, oh, that's not true. You want to go to Mark chapter 16? Can we hear something? Hallelujah. Mark 16. I think we're all well, right? Okay. Mark chapter 16, it says that they, they went everywhere preaching the gospel, and the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. Whenever the gospel is preached, there are miracles. Hallelujah. Okay, just look, look, a couple more scriptures, then we'll be done. First Corinthians 1 17. Paul said, I didn't, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. So that the word of Christ may not be void. Great temptation. We live in an entertainment centered culture. Yes? Okay. The rest of that, I mean, it's just all, everywhere. It isn't like we have an entertainment. I mean, they might, 200 years ago, we had a barn raising and a dance afterwards or something. I mean, you, there wasn't a lot of entertainment options. Now, it doesn't matter what your preference is. You have, what, hundreds of channels on there? I don't think you can explore it very much, but I mean, if you've got a preference, it's on there somewhere, right? So because of that, it can be very, very tempting for a preacher to try to be very, very, very current to where we get catchphrases and we try to, we try to find the latest trend with the latest technology. I'm not in favor of being current. But you know, look at what he said in verse 17. He didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. There's going to be a ton of preachers go out of this place. And you say, oh, you're airy. No, I know in my heart there's so many young men. A lot of them are, some of them are off at the honor academy right now, right? But I mean, there are so many. And you say, what if I'm not standing in the pulpit? You're still going to be, a lot of people call the priests that aren't in the pulpit. They just share everywhere. Their life share. That you're not called to impress people with how cool you are in sharing the Gospels. If you have the four spiritual laws and that's your way to do it, that's fine. But the Gospel is that Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God that took you from a place where you couldn't get yourself out of. And he loves you so much that if he loved you that much and you buy that, you couldn't go wrong serving him. That's the Gospel. Amen. Amen. He says, you didn't come with cleverness of speech. Now look at what 18 says. For the word of the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing, but to us, it is the power of God. The Word is the power of God made available to us. Okay, we're going to try to wrap this up. You can spend months trying to find a fancier, more palatable, complicated gospel, but you can never make it more powerful. You can only weaken it. Because the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most powerful event in history, it was carried out the potential to reverse every human destiny in one fell swoop. Now think about when you encountered the cross. It changed your identity from a child of Satan to a child of God. It changed your destiny from heaven to hell. It changed your desires. Instead of wanting to be a jerk and proud of it, even when you are a jerk, there's something in your heart that doesn't want to be. Isn't that right? You don't want to be a jerk anymore. You used to just tell somebody off and feel real good about it. Now you tell them off. How do I explain that one to the Lord? Your, your desires change. Right. That moment your name appeared in the Lamb's Book of Life, one is going at the cross, cross. You went from being cursed to blessed, from confusion to peace, from being unknown in heaven to being known there. We're going to see next week that the word of the cross is the highest reality that there is. I don't care what disease you carry in your body. If the word of the cross becomes real enough to you, it will bow to, the, to, to that high reality. Amen. You are redeemed from sickness. Every thought we ever think should be
permeated by that reality. Paul called this the glorious gospel of the blessed God. He said that the Lord abolished death and brought life and immortality through the gospel. Now the amazing thing is, we know and celebrate the fact that the event was that powerful, that God made words in such a way that they can carry the same explosive power that raised Jesus from the dead. You see, we know that if we've been there and he exploded out of that grave and the angels raised, you know, rolled the stone away and it's just this exciting day, that's wonderful. But what we don't realize is that the word, I'll show you in a minute. It says the gospel is the power of God. The word of the cross is the power and it will change anything. I love this Mark Hankins quote. He said this, when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and Jesus Christ stepped forth from the tomb, he stepped forth as the absolute master over death in all its phases, over hell with all its hosts, and over Satan with all its works. Jesus was the firstborn, the archetype. I always thought that was archetype, but the Merriam-Webster audio dictionary says archetype. Does anyone have to say that, archetype? You know what I mean, though, right? It's, he was the prototype of a whole new race of people. If any man is in Christ, the old things passed away, new things have come. Amen. As victorious as he is, is who we are. And, and you know, we think, well, yeah, we know about the cross. There's, there's more. When Jesus Christ stepped forth from the tomb, he was the absolute master of death in all its phases. Hell with all its hopes and Satan, Satan with all of his works. He was the archetype of the prototype of everything God wanted from the new, new humanity. Like the first Corvette rolling off the assembly line. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son in all his power. Right. T.L. Osborne says this, preachers think they need more power than all they need is more gospel. The gospel is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Okay, really, I know I said we're letting you go. It's like 20 till. Five more minutes, right? You all good for five more minutes? I want you to think, you see, today we're talking about the, the cross, the center event of history. It is the dividing line. It will be the dividing line between you and some friends. You say, I don't want it to be that way. It's always been that way for every Christian that's ever been. Because if they cannot accept the cross and they reject the Savior and you're serving him, it's going to, I'm not saying you can't be friends, but there's going to be a division there. Okay? Think of everything you said goodbye to at the cross. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself up for me. You said goodbye to the old view of the cross. Look at Romans 6.6. 6, if you don't believe that one. Read this with me. Knowing this. That our old. Am I, I'm the only one here. Everybody shake up. Just five minutes. It'll help. Okay. Read it with, read with me. Knowing this. That our old self was crucified with him. In order that our body of sin might be done away with. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. You know what you said? Put the body to the cross. You said the body. You, that old me, selfish. What about me? What about me? You. The old nature was crucified at the cross. Number one. The second thing you said the body was the world. Now you say, well, I still like the world pretty much. Well, then it's time for you to start doing some dead reckoning. I heard, I heard a sermon many, many years ago by the great missionary, somebody God missionary evangelist Mark Montaigne. His wife told us. He was a missionary to India, one of the most intense human beings I ever saw in my life. He was on the platform, and he, he, he was just like this all the time, talking about that orphanage in India. And he said, it's time for Christians to do some dead reckoning. Now, what's dead reckoning? What? If all the fancy instruments on a ship failed, and you were at sea, lost, and you had nothing but the North Star and a sextant, you might not know exactly where you were, but what you did is you started out doing the dead reckoning of things that had to be. And he knew if you kept going in the same direction, you'd reach a certain economy. But dead reckoning. There are certain things from this word that you've got to reckon yourself dead to sin because the Bible says you are. Yeah. And you say, well, you know, my self-help group, they want me to say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm an alcoholic. Now, I'm, I know this is touchy ground, but I want to understand this. I'm not against any group that helps anybody. And I know AA has helped a lot of people. Even before. But I want to tell you something. If you're born again, you are not an alcoholic anymore. Because that alcoholic got nailed to the cross. It's time to do dead reckoning where you said, my old flesh is gone. Look at what this says in 
In Galatians 6, 14, it says that we died to the world. Hallelujah. Paul says, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Well, this is real important, especially for young people. I'm going to tell you why it's so important for young people. When you're young, you think, oh, that world looks pretty good, all these things, it's probably glitzy. Yeah, but what you don't see is right over the hill is, defe is defeat and despair and agony and heartache. Right. And the rest of us who are beyond 25 Come or 35, on. we can tell you, been there, done that, yeah. take it from a pro. <coughs> okay. yeah. So number one, you said goodbye to the old you at the cross. You said goodbye to the world at the cross. You said goodbye to the past at the cross. First Corinthians 6 Verse 9 tells everybody that won't inherit the kingdom. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters. Now, what does fornicators mean? That means sleeping with somebody you're not married to. You say, you shouldn't talk about this. I'm reading the Bible. Amen. I'm giving you a definition. Because if this says fornicators don't inherit the kingdom and you're fornicating, you need to do something about it. Amen. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's pretty blunt. You don't go to heaven if you're a fornicator or an idolater or an adulterer or feminine or homosexual. Come on. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but yeah. you were washed at the cross of Jesus Christ. You were washed, sanctified, justified in the name. So you said goodbye to your past at the cross. Isn't that wonderful? You said goodbye to your own nature. You said goodbye to the world. You said goodbye to your past. And the fourth thing is you said goodbye to the whole list of crimes that were against you. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says that everything done, that you have done, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions and having canceled out the certificate of death consisting of the praise against us. It was hostile to us, and he took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That means the whole list of everything you've done against God was nailed to the cross. You said goodbye to your own nature. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. To the, oh, how the world. The world of the cross, the word of the cross is foolish to those who don't understand, but to us it is the power of God. And the word of the cross will always be a dividing line. The day he died, everybody chose up sides. We went over that. Herod and Pilate became past friends. The religious leaders sneered the soldiers, mocked one thief heard of yours. But on the other hand, the other thief requested mercy. The Roman centurion worshipped God. Joseph of Arimathea laid down his reputation to take care of the Lord's body. This cross is the dividing line of history of people and people groups. When we declare the cross, it is not an old message, but it is an ent a timeless, eternal message. It is more current than today's head tomorrow's headlines. You yeah. know why I know? Because I have this hard, I just like to go through magazines and I like to read and I like to learn. I find stuff, a, a newspaper that's two weeks old, do you know how laughable it is? Uh, None of it matters after two weeks, okay? Yeah. You think, well, if I get know tomorrow's headlines, that would be more current than the cross. No, because in another week, they will be old news and right. nothing. Amen. And the word of the cross will be, yeah. and you say, can you prove that? Yeah, I'd just like you to see, let me ask you this. If the book of Revelation talks about the cross of Jesus Christ and what he did for us over and over and over, could you then agree with me that this is an eternal message that will yeah, affect right. us through eternity? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's just read these scriptures fast. Revelation 1, 5. It says, to him who loves us. This is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Is he still reminding us of his honor in the all caps? Yes. We read this before. It says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So when we, when they see him, do you know how they'll see him? As the crucified one. Amen? Yes. Yes. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. This is the worship in heaven. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood. Does that sound like the cross? men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be kings and priests and they will reign upon the earth. Revelation 12, 10, 11 says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. He says, now I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. Now how do you overcome Satan? 
The first way is by the blood of the cross, the blood of the Lamb. They overcame it by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony because they did not love their life. You see, the blood of the Lord goes all the way through to the end. When, when Jesus, if you, Revelation 13, 8, we read before, the, he is called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. If you're tired of the message of the cross, you'll have a hard time in heaven because it's always going to be in our face. And you say, why? Because, number one, there is no greater proof of love in all of history. Yeah. When Jesus appeared to Thomas, first, let's just read this one place. In John chapter 20, he appeared to 10 of the disciples. Judas was dead. Thomas wasn't there. And in, in John 20, verse 19, he said to put it in their fingers. He said, put your fingers in my hands. In, in your hand on my side. Remember that? <laughs> so it's evening on the first day of the week when the doors were shut. For the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. I have a question. Did he look as big a mess as he did after he was scourged? No. He was raised. He was healed. Why didn't the Father do a complete job? Why didn't he Come just on. do the healing? Uh -huh. You aren't going to have any scars in heaven. I'm so glad. I remember one time I was in fourth grade, my family went on a 30-day vacation, and the first day of the vacation I was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. I decided to skip rope down a gravel hill. <laughs> Both of my hands were laid open. Uh, knees, I mean, I was such a mess. And I was like, if, if every scar you ever had was on your body, uh, you know what, in heaven, you're not going to have one boo-boo on your whole body. You know, you're not going to end perfect. What's wrong with Jesus? Why are there holes? Brother Hagen saw him and hit him. He said, yeah. I can see light. Why? Because the cross was the event of history. It was the central hinging of all humanity. He never wants you to forget how much you, he loved you. Amen. And he said, why are you so dramatic? Because if you could know how much he loved you, you would not be afraid of what you're afraid of right now. Whatever it is you find. You say, I like it when you're more practical preacher. No, sometimes that's fun. I want to tell you something. The gospel is the power of God. The word of the cross. It's to those who are perishing foolishness, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of Almighty God to divide you from everything that was ever meant to hurt you. Our risen Savior was simply the prototype, the perfect example of who we're to be. Amen. A lot of pressure on the Church of Jesus Christ in North America to preach something other than the cross. That's true. A lot of pressure to preach psychology and uh -huh. nice things. Oh, yeah. But I want to tell you, to all of you who know that in your deepest heart, you think, a couple things I want to say about this. First of all, you say, well, Pastor, I wouldn't know what to preach. Listen, some of the most effective evangelists ever were in the same two months. That's right. You know why? Because a, a, a little child can preach the gospel. Right, amen. God Almighty loved mankind so much he could not bear to think of them all going to hell. So he took on flesh, lived a perfect life, offered himself as a sacrifice, planned work, God raised him from the dead, and everything was reversed. Everything changed that day. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I presented to you what of first importance. This is the first importance that Christ Jesus yeah. died for the sins of Christ. That he was buried and raised from the third day on the third day. That's the gospel. What are the points? You can you can tell somebody and you say, what if they mock? Well, they always will until they get saved. Right. It's a divided thought. But it's also their only hope. So for those of you who think, well, I don't think I could preach the gospel. Yeah, you, you know enough right now to preach. It's not a matter of anything. I don't feel it. None of us ever feel it. The other thing is, you know, if you know enough to preach the gospel, you know enough to overcome anything that Satan is trying to do to you to intimidate you. This gospel divides you from everything and anything Satan ever meant to hurt you. I don't care whether it's lack in your finances, whatever it is, the word of the cross divides you from it. I don't know if this has helped you or not, but don't ever make it, don't ever make it so hard. The last thing I want to say is, you know, we come from a lot of different denominations. We don't ever put down that, you know, we may not go to the Catholic Church now. The truth is that the Catholic Church believes 
I'm reading all these articles about the Pope retiring, and I think, my goodness, do you know that in what we believe, we're so close? Mom. And I know so many Baptists are sitting there thinking, did she just say that? I can see how you're all on your face. Well, I was taught, they said, why is this important? Because a lot of times we make a big, big deal out of the stuff that isn't a big deal. Right. And we forgot to make a really big deal about what we agree on, Amen. what is important. Amen. And if the church would just lay aside all the little stuff and center on the big stuff, we get our babies healed and we get the lost. This, this is on. the power of God. Amen. Okay. Amen.